Uh, so that next speaker is Elder Marcus Nash, who is a member of the First Quorum of the Seventy of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Well, as, as I got ready and got dressed this morning, I put on my normal uniform of a suit and tie. And I walked into this, I thought, well, at least I should put on my green suit and tie, you know. At any rate, it's really an honor to participate in this symposium with those who represent many of the great faiths of the world. I am truly grateful to be among you here today. We share a common concern for the environment and a common desire to draw others into the creator of heaven and earth. Prior to my call as a general authority for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which I will call for you here on out as the LDS Church, I practice law in the city of Seattle, the state of Washington, where I was born and raised, and frankly, a place where nature's splendor is on display. It's a beautiful place to live. And I like Utah, too. <laughs> now, one of the first clients I represented is a brand new lawyer fresh out of law school was a berry farmer near Mount Vernon, Washington. The farmer raised and he sold certified nursery stock, strawberry stock, which could be sold as certified only if it was not infested with nematodes, which are small groundworms that can damage the productivity and the health of the plant. The proven way at the time to rid the plant of this pest and to achieve certified status was to fumigate the soil. According to the fumigant manufacturer, the fumigant agent would gasify upon application and evaporate through the soil into the air. The nematodes would be killed, the soil and groundwater were said to be un unaffected. Well, the neighbors in the vicinity of where this farmer was farming began to notice an odor in their water. They had tests performed and it seemed that not all the fumigant actually evaporated into the air, but some portion had leached into the groundwater, rendering it unusable for human consumption. Now this story shows the inherent complexity of human interaction with the environment. The farmer was making an honest living. The only way to produce nursery stock not infected with the nematodes was to fumigate. Yet the fumigation polluted the earth. And as a result, the neighbors lost the use of their groundwater. Although the farmer was eventually dismissed from the case, he had to endure significant stress and some economic repercussions. The fumigant manufacturers whom we did not represent, well, they had their own end on that case. Then what of future generations that have to grapple with groundwater contamination of an unknown duration? I find it interesting, if not mildly ironic, that it's likely that the very families that sued my client and the fumigant manufacturer, and I don't fault them for that, I'm not criticizing them, had at some point during the litigation, they probably enjoyed fresh, delicious strawberries grown from certified nursery stock. An interesting turn of events there. Now, I'm not going to try to unravel these complexities. That's not what I'm here for today. These, that's, not, that's not my perception. But they do help us to remember that our approach to the environment really is something complex. And we must be prudent, realistic, balanced, and act consistent with the needs of the earth and, with, and of current and future generations. Now, in an effort to get to the root of the problem, and there's no pun intended there, I actually I realized there was a pun there later on, <laughs> I suggest that it cannot be reasonably disputed that we depend upon this earth to sustain life. And two, that the quality of the earth and its environment will directly affect the quality of our life and that of future generations. And I keep mentioning future generations. We need to keep them in mind. Despite what I believe to be an almost universal agreement on these postulates, they have been by many ignored, unappreciated, and are simply seen as too costly or inconvenient. I believe that if we understand who we are, the purpose of our existence, and the reason the earth was created, and keep these things in mind, and I appreciate the comments have been made by those who have spoken earlier, that our conduct would rise to a higher, nobler level. And that is where religion and faith, in my mind, play a major role. Now, I've been asked to represent the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in this symposium on faith and the environment. I've considered several ways that I could approach this today. And I've decided the only truly unique thing that I have to offer you today 
would be to explain the doctrine of the LDS Church, as I understand it, pertaining to this earth and all life thereon. I've broken this presentation into eight different sections, organized around different verses of scripture that we view as sacred. The first three sections <clears throat> will provide a doctrinal context for the next five sections, and those are the sections that will address more directly what the church believes about the environment. This is the first, this is the first scripture. What is man? that thou art mindful of him. In this psalm, David of the Old Testament considers the majestic creations of God, and then he wonders aloud why, amongst such wonders, God is mindful of man. God, David concludes that the fact that God cares and gives humankind a dominant role on this earth is evidence that humankind is special. He says, quote, a little lower than the angels, close quote. What we understand of who we are and why we are on this earth can and should have a profound effect upon how we choose to relate to earth and all life thereon. For that reason, I will go into some detail in the doctrine of the LDS Church or the faith on the purpose of the creation of this earth to set the proper context. One of the prophets we revere, revere with much of Christianity is Moses of the Old Testament. According to the Prologate Price, which is a book of scripture unique to the church, uh, to the LDS church, Moses saw in a vision the creations of, of God, worlds without number in a limitless expanse. And then he declared, and I quote him, now for this cause I know that man is nothing, which thing I had never supposed, close quote. In Moses' humility before the magnificence of God's creations, he failed to comprehend a great truth that the Lord wanted him to understand. So, in this scriptural account, the Lord returns to Moses and shows him again his vast and limitless creation and drives a point home to Moses by declaring that he, God, has made these creations, quote, for his own purpose, close quote. And then he explains that that purpose is to, quote, bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man, close quote. In short, according to LDS doctrine, God desires that humankind progress, improve, and receive eternal reward, <clears throat> and he created this earth for that purpose. This simply stated yet stunning truth seems natural to those of, to the, to those of us of faith who accept at face value the Apostle Paul's description of our parent-child relationship with God set forth in the New Testament, namely that we are, quote, the offspring of God, close quote. The importance of this is better appreciated with the next item of doctrine or the next scripture that I'd like to explain. We read again in the Pearl of Great Price that before this world was created, God explained in practical terms why he would create this earth for his children to live on as mortal beings. He said, and I quote, we will make an earth whereon these, meaning us, may dwell, and we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. And then he added that those who choose to follow and serve God in this life upon this earth will have, quote, glory added upon their heads forever and ever, close quote. In short, the creation of this earth affords us the opportunity to choose, to seek, and someday receive all that God offers. However, one cannot and should not be forced to follow God. Indeed, real growth and development in an individual occurs only when one has the opportunity to choose for him or herself. And for this reason, we read in the Book of Mormon, another scripture, obviously, that the Mormons believe in, that, quote, the Lord God gave unto man that he should act for himself, close quote. So the earth was created to provide a place for the children of God to be tested, to learn and gain necessary experience in a place where they would have the opportunity to choose whether they will or will not do all things the Lord commands. Once the process of the creation of the earth was completed, God was pleased and he stated, quote, behold, all things that I have made were very good, close quote. He was pleased because he saw that the earth would serve his purpose for us, his children. According to the biblical account, once the earth was created with plant and animal life, the stage was set for Adam and Eve, the first man and woman. 
they, they were, and then they were placed upon the earth. God's plan was, and is, that his children come to this earth through marriage between a man and a woman who are to procreate, form a family, and teach children to choose the good part in a world with real moral choices and consequences. According to a revelation to the prophet Joseph Smith, the founding prophet of this church, the Almighty so designed this in order that, quote, the earth might answer the end of its creation, that it might be filled with the measure of man according to his creation before the world was made, close quote. Consistent with this, a Book of Mormon prophet of ancient America recorded, the Lord hath created the earth that it should be inhabited, and he hath created his children that they should possess it. Close quote. We see that, we can then see that, according to LDS doctrine, man and woman are not mere interlopers on a, or a sideshow on this earth. Rather, they and the children they bring into this world really are central to its purpose. Now another scriptural term, uh, for, uh, scripture. For I, the Lord God, created all things spiritually before they were naturally upon the earth. Now I'm finally almost to a point where I have laid down sufficient doctrinal context to begin to talk about what the LDS faith directly teaches about this earth and how we should treat the environment. But first, I will explore a little bit more about the process of the creation of this earth as a last piece of doctrinal context for a discussion on how we should treat the planet. Not only did God create a beautiful world of mountains, valleys, rivers, streams, seas, sunrises, and sunsets, but he also adorned it with plant and animal life. According to LDS scripture, each form of plant and animal life has a spirit. In the Pearl of Great Price, we read, I, the Lord God, made the heaven and the earth, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For I, the Lord God, created all things spiritually before they were naturally upon the earth. Close quote. Further, he declared, and I quote again, out of the ground made I, the Lord God, to grow every tree naturally that is pleasant to the sight of man. And it, also, and it became also a living soul, for it was spiritual in the day that I created it. Then with regard to animal life, we read, and again I quote, out of the ground I, the Lord God, formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and they were also living souls. Close quote. Since both plant and animal life are living souls, they're capable of experiencing happiness as they fulfill the measure of their creation. <clears throat> as one of the presidents of the church, Joseph Fielding Smith, taught long ago, and I quote him, the Lord gave life to every creature and commanded them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. It was intended that all creatures should be happy in their several elements, close quote. Not only is animal life capable of happiness, but it is also included within the scope of the Lord's redeeming power, as taught by this uniquely LDS scripture. Quote, and the end shall come, and the heaven and the earth shall be consumed and pass away, and there shall be a new heaven and a new earth. For all old things shall pass away, and all things shall become new, even the heaven and the earth, and all the fullness thereof, both men and beasts, the fowls of the air and the fishes of the sea, and not one hair, neither moat, shall be lost, for it is the workmanship of mine hands." Close quote. Plainly, all form of life identified in this ver verse have great value in the eyes of God, for they are the workmanship of his hand and will be blessed by his redeeming power. This doctrine leads one to view plant and animal life differently, I hope as living souls created by God. Now another scripture, ordained for the use of man. As we were discussed, according to LDS doctrine, this earth, as well as the plant and animal life thereon, were provided for the use of man. However, we believe that God has commanded that the earth and all things thereon be utilized responsibly to abundantly sustain the human family. Joseph Smith received the following revelation, and I quote, 
Behold, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air, and that which cometh of the earth is ordained for the use of man for food and for raiment, and that he might have in abundance." Close quote. Nevertheless, LDS doctrine is clear. All humankind are stewards over this earth and its bounty, not owners, and will be accountable to God for what we do with regard to his creation. In another revelation received by the prophet Joseph Smith, who we revere again as a prophet, the Lord rightfully asserts his ownership over this earth and all things thereon. He says, and I quote, for it is expedient that I, the Lord, should make every man accountable as a steward over earthly blessings, which I have made and prepared for my creatures. I, the Lord, stretched out the heavens and built the earth, my very handiwork, and all things therein are mine." Close quote. So how we care for the earth, how we utilize and share in its bounty, and how we treat all life that has been provided for our benefit and use is part of our test in mortality. Thus, when God gave unto man, now I'll quote the biblical account in Genesis, quote, dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, close quote, it was not without boundaries or limits. He intends man's dominion to be what we could call a righteous dominion, meaning that it is guided, curbed, and enlightened by the doctrine of his gospel, a gospel defined by God's love for us and our love for him and his works. I like what was said about asking, what would God have me do? This unbridled, the, the unbridled, voracious consumer is not consistent with God's plan of happiness, which calls for humility, meekness, gratitude, and mutual respect. In other words, as stewards, not owners, over this earth, and all life thereon, we are to gratefully make use of that which the Lord has provided, avoiding wasting life and resources, and to use the bounty of the earth to care for the poor. In another scripture given by Joseph Smith, we read, quote, But it is not given that one man should possess that which is above another. Therefore, the world lieth in sin. It's an interesting comment as I'm reading this, is recalling what has been said earlier in these presentations today. And woe be unto man that sheddeth blood, or wasteth flesh, and hath no need." Close quote. He goes on and he says, continuing the quote, For the earth is full, and there is enough and to spare. Yea, I prepared all things, and have given unto the children of men to be agents unto themselves. Therefore, if any man shall take of the abundance which I have made, and impart not his portion according to the law of my gospel unto the poor and the needy, he shall, with the wicked, lift up his eyes in hell, being in torment." Close quote. Seems the Lord feels strongly about taking care of the poor. As we have already discussed, the Lord gave to men and women agency, or the capacity to choose. However, we must bear in mind that he cares deeply for all life, and especially for his children, and will hold us accountable for what we choose to do or not do with the bounties of his creation. The next scripture, it pleaseth, pleaseth God that he hath given all these things unto man. In another revelation to the prophet Joseph Smith, humankind is promised that if we choose to follow the Lord and judiciously use the resources of the earth with thanksgiving and respect, quote, the fullness of the earth is yours, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and that which climbeth upon the trees and walketh upon the earth. Yea, and the herb, and the good things which come of the earth, whether for food, or for raiment, or for houses, or for barns, or for orchards, or for gardens, or for vineyards. Yea, all things which come of the earth, in the season thereof, are made for the benefit and use of man, both to please the eye, and to gladden the heart. Yea, for food, and for raiment, for taste, and for smell, to strengthen the body, and to enliven the soul. And it pleaseth God that he hath given all these things unto man. For unto this end were they made to be used with judgment, not to excess, neither by extortion. Close quote. Yes, we have been provided this beautiful and bountiful world, teeming with life and resources to bless and strengthen 
and enliven mankind, and we are to use them joyfully, but we must do so as careful, grateful stewards over God's handiwork. We are to use these resources with judgment, gratitude, prudence, and with an eye to bless our fellow man and woman and those of future generations, and in that way, help him to accomplish his purpose to help humankind progress, improve, and receive his blessings in time and in eternity. Next scripture. The God of heaven looked upon the residue of the people, and he wept. This comes out of the, the Pearl of Great Price. As we have discussed, we live in a world in which individuals may choose to reject God and treat his creation with disdain. When this occurs, God and creation are pained. LDS scripture, can, again contained in the Pearl of Great Price, relates a vision in which Enoch of the Old Testament, of Old Testament times, saw that the God of heaven wept on account of the poor choices and the suffocating selfishness of his children. In the Book of Mormon, it's prophesied. This is an interesting prophecy. It, it contained the Book of Mormon. It's prophesied that in the latter days, there would be, now I'll quote, fires, tempests, and vapors of smoke, and great pollutions upon the face of this earth. And that such conditions, now continue, would be coupled with, now continue the quote, murders, and robbing, and lying, and deceiving, and whoredoms, and all manner of abominations. And there shall be many who will say, do this or do that, it mattereth not, close quote. According to Aldea's scripture, there is a corollary between the selfish, materialistic man out to hoard money, material possessions, and or the man with an irreverence for life, and pollutions, spiritual or temporal, upon the face of this earth. As President Ezra Tev Benson said, who was a, was a former president of the church, of the LDS church, he stated, quote, irreverence for God of life and for a fellow man takes the form of things like littering, heedless strip mining, and pollution of water and air. But these are, after all, outward expressions of the inner man, close quote. Gordon B. Hinckley, another former president of this church, stated, quote, the earth is his creation, and when we make it ugly, we offend him, close quote. According to LDS scripture, when man pollutes this world spiritually or temporally, not only God, but nature itself suffers. In the Pearl of Great Price, we read, quote, Enoch looked upon the earth, and he heard a voice from the bowels thereof, saying, Woe, woe is me, the mother of men, I am pained. I am weary because of the wickedness of my children. When shall I rest and be cleansed from the filthiness which has gone forth out of me? When will my creator sanctify me that I may rest and righteousness for a season abide upon my face? Upon hearing the earth mourn, which may be metaphorical, Weenip, excuse me, Enoch, quote, wept and cried unto the Lord, saying, O Lord, wilt thou not have compassion upon the earth? Close quote. Many of you have seen the spiritual and temporal pollution, scars and damage wrought by man upon this earth, and well may we all chime in with Enoch and ask ourselves, will we not have compassion upon the earth? Or are we too caught up in our personal pursuits and vindication of personal rights or desires that we feel? Another scripture. In a revelation given to the prophet Joseph Smith, the Lord stated that he, his aim in organizing his church was to create a society in which every man sought the interest of his neighbor and doing all things with an eye single to the glory of God. Faith and religion should have the capacity to stretch, enlarge, and change the human soul beyond self and to inspire love of God and his creations, even to the point of sacrificing personal issues or desires. We all need that soul, I sure do. We need that soul stretching. For the state of the human soul will directly impact the condition and health of the environment, which in turn affects our quality of life and that of future generations. Thus, the late Neil A. Maxwell, 
who was a member of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles in the LDS Church, he invited followers of Christ to live lives of, he called, moral integrity. And I'll quote him. True disciples of Christ, he states, would be consistent environmentalists, caring both about maintaining the spiritual health of a marriage and preserving a rainforest, caring about preser preserving the nutrient capacity of a family, as well as providing a healthy supply of air and water, close quote. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ teaches us to live lives of this internal consistency, true to God, true to his present and yet to be born children, and true to the purposes of his creation. To the degree that it enlarges our understanding of who we are and why this earth was created and inspires us to respect the earth as the handiwork of God and to think of others, including future generations, religion can change how we will treat the earth and all things thereon. Ezra Taft Benson, again, the former president of the church, he expressed it this way. Quote, the Lord works from the, from the inside out. The world works from the outside in. The world would mold men by changing their environment. Christ changes men, who then change their environment. And I would add, for the better. As the human soul is thus changed, the environment is better cared for. The doctrine and commandments of God lead us beyond the suffocating, self-limiting weight of selfishness and the blinding press of self-gratification or aggrandizement. The gospel of Jesus Christ helps us to think beyond ourselves, to think of the earth and all life given by God and to think of others now and in future generations rather than pursue the immediate vindication of our personal desires or avowed rights. If I pursue a selfish, irreverent course, I am pursuing a course that gives license to despoil the earth for pollution, damage, and waste are almost always the product of selfishness or irreverence. To the degree that religion teaches reverence for God, for his creations, for life, and for our fellow man, it will teach us to care for the environment. In short, the state of the human soul and the environment are interconnected. Each affects and influences the other. And a bit, a bit of a historical footnote here, Brigham Young, who led the persecuted members of the LDS Church in, from, in the mid-1800s in mid from the eastern states of this country into this desert valley. He stated, quote, in the mind of God, there is no such thing as dividing spiritual from temporal or temporal from spiritual, for they are one in the Lord, close quote. When those early pioneers arrived, this valley was mostly uncultivated desert, but with fertile soil and water from mountain runoffs. So they went to work to carve a civilization out of the wilderness. Even at those times, Brigham Young understood the doctrine of which I have spoken, and he told those early pioneers the following, quote, keep your valley pure. Keep your towns as pure as you possibly can. Keep your hearts pure, close quote. He added the need to study and reverence the Lord's creations. He said, quote, Fields and mountains, trees and flowers, and all that fly, swim, or move upon the ground are lessons for study in the great school of our Heavenly Father and the great laboratory of nature. Close quote. Enjoined those pioneers to care and to not waste nature and its bounty, stating that, quote, it is not our privilege to waste the Lord's substance. Close quote. How am I doing on time? Ooh, okay. <laughs> I'll skip a portion of this. I'll go to the last section now. Here's the last scripture that I'll cite to you. This scripture states, All things which come of the earth are made for the benefit of man, both to please the eye and to gladden the heart and to enliven the soul. I've read this one to you already, you may recall. Now in conclusion, the earth and all life thereon are much more than items to be consumed and or conserved. There are parts to be preserved. As we nurture and appreciate nature, we will become better acquainted with our God, for unspoiled nature is designed to inspire and uplift humankind. Nature in its pristine state brings us closer to God, clears the mind and the heart of the noise and distractions of materialism, lifts us to a higher, more exalted sphere, and helps us to better know our God. And in Revelation through the prophet Joseph Smith,
the Lord declares, I really like this one, quote, the earth rolls upon her wings, and the sun giveth his light by day, and the moon giveth her light by night, and the stars also give their light as they roll upon their wings in their glory. In the midst of the power of God, behold, any man who hath seen any or the least of these hath seen God moving in his majesty and power. Now, I am an avid hiker. I grew up hiking in the North Central Cascades in Washington State, where I was born and raised, and have hiked in various parts of the country and in various places of the world. I loved in my childhood to be in the woods, to sense, to feel the silent yet eloquent witness that those towering evergreen trees there in the state of Washington bore of the Creator. As I grew older, my wanderings in the wilderness took me beyond the woods to climb the magnificent granite rocks and peaks rising above the timberline, where the only sound is the wind moving through rock and some scrub trees fighting to survive in a harsh alpine environment. These high peaks humble in their magnificence before God, who designed and made this earth touch the blue vault of the heavens. Although silent, they speak of the power and majesty of God and of his matchless genius for beauty. The prophet Alma of the Book of Mormon agrees, he said, all things denote that there is a God. Yea, even the earth and all things that are upon the face of it do witness that there is a spiritual, there is a, 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 a creator. There is a spirit among the trees. Are they not living souls? Yet, and even more so for me, above Timberline, amongst the mountaintops, where I feel a closeness to our God. I love to sit or stand under the sky where heaven and earth meet, the high alpine peaks around me, and to gaze upon the stars at night, trying, always unsuccessfully, to wrap my mind around the eternity within my gaze, and an eternity of both time and space. Imagine, for example, the hundreds, millions of years it took some of that light to reach us. Yet I always marvel at the quiet knowledge that settles upon me in those solitary moments that despite the vastness of the cosmos, the Lord of the universe knows puny me. And he knows you and each of his children. This creation, every aspect of it, was created for the purpose of giving each of us the opportunity to be blessed now and in eternity. This creation witnesses of the creator. And if we preserve these special places in their unspoiled state, they will silently, eloquently witness of our God and, and inspire us onward and upward. This earth is provided to help each of us to return to him, having grown through testing and experience to become more like him and enjoy eternal felicity with him. Our test on this earth is whether we will choose wisely and follow God, treat his creations with respect, and use them to bless our fellow man and woman. The better we care for this world and, and all in it, the better it will care for us. The better it will strengthen, enliven, and gladden our hearts and our spirits and prepare us to dwell with our Heavenly Father with our families and the celestial sphere, which members of the LDS Church believe will be the very earth upon which we stand today, but in a glorified state. May we care for this earth, our present and future home, well. Thank you.